Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with your charismatic host and prominent safety expert, Dr. David Perotin. Be entertained and informed as the Safety Doc discusses both best and bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. The truth will keep you safe. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Welcome, everybody. This is David, and this is the Safety Doc Podcast. Today we're going to talk a lot about the Hurricane Harvey Rescue, also the Cajun Navy, kind of this organic group which has stepped in to be a significant player in the rescue right now happening in the greater Houston area. And you know what? Um, there's a, <laughs> there's just a lot of missteps that have, have gone on, um, and I'm going to talk about those this reminds me a lot of Katrina, specifically in the staging and utilization of resources or lack of utilization of resources. So I'm taking the time limits off this show. You know, we might go a little bit longer because, hey, I've got a lot to talk about. At the very start, I want to point out that there are countless, countless numbers of folks uh, with the Houston Fire Department, police, um, other emergency rescue agencies uh, from around the area, the Cajun Navy, and so on, doing tremendous work right now, putting their lives on the line, working 20 hours a day to, to just maximum fatigue to help others during this rescue. I do not want to come off in this episode as at all um, demeaning the efforts of those folks because they are heroes they are doing a wonderful job, but there's not enough of them. There's not enough of them out there. It's not their fault. It's the fault of, and I'm going to point this out, of not having an organized uh, national response, um, likely through FEMA. I'm going to talk about why FEMA might have, have been slow to get to this. Um, but it's like having this big fire. Imagine the, this big fire. And, you know, you, you have one or two fire trucks that are responding, and then some citizens come out, and you've got the bucket brigade, and everybody's doing what they can. But yet, um, with, a, with a few more phone calls, um, you know, you could get some additional equipment over there and, and, and really be able to, to better handle the situation that's going on. Not that it's quite that simple, but, uh, but there's, some, there's some definite things going on here uh, which are quite disturbing to me as a rescue expert. So I'm going to get into that. Um, so today's show is called Houston Dunkirk, Cajun Navy, and Fixing FEMA's Botched Response Protocol. And I have two anecdotes to start out. So <laughs> the first one, uh, the other day I was out with my youngest daughter, she's seven, and we were doing a bike ride. We were about a block away, and um, she was getting a little close to the curb. It was the day before uh, recycling pickup. So we have one of these recycling bin, bins that you roll down to the end of the, the driveway. And uh, and anyway, like, you know, we're getting closer to a house, um, you know, about a block away. And this recycling bin is, is out by the curb. And she's getting closer and closer into it. And what she's doing is she's she's looking ahead. There, there's, there's some kids playing out on a lawn um, a few houses down. And, and I say something to her. I'm like, swerve out, swerve out. And, and she, she runs into it, okay? She wasn't going very fast and, and basically just crumples the bike over and, and, and she falls down. Um, thankfully, check her out. She's fine. Um, check her out. The bike is, the bike is fine. But, but it looked like something that you would have seen in, in a movie. Um, but again, so thankful uh, she was going very slow and just just wasn't paying attention. And so, you know, did the dad thing of, of kind of brushing it off pretty fast of, of, you know, are you are you OK? You know, stand up, you know, jump a couple couple times, you know, stretch out. And and uh, and, and she was ready to get back and, and get on the trip and, and we continue the bike trip. Um, but but just watching this, um, I'm like, oh, my goodness, she's she's going to run into this this recycling bin. So. Not that we haven't all been there at some point in life. So um, Saturday morning, I, I, I was I was pretty um, pretty deep into to Twitter and social media on Friday night uh, regarding uh, Hurricane Harvey, and I got a call um, early Saturday morning from the Fox News Network out of New York. 
And uh, and they said, hey, uh, we would like to have you as a safety expert. So, you know, I do have a Ph.D., did my dissertation on high-stakes decision-making in safety situations across industries, obtained that from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And they said, hey, we would like to have you on a show, Fox and Friends, um, and, and talk about the safety rescue um, going on in, in Houston, specifically talking about the potential for drone use. Because I did interview Preston Rice a few weeks ago, and I have made some additional um, posts about how drones could be used in the reconnaissance aspect of this rescue. So, hey, and this is where they go. They're like, we will send a car to come to your house to get you. And, and I get an email, you know, like a minute later with protocol and all of this stuff. So I'm like, hey, this is good. You know, this, this is good stuff. Uh, millions of people, you know, watching it. Ten minutes later, they call. Um, yeah, Dave, we, we, we located somebody that's in, in, uh, in Texas, and they're pretty, pretty close to where this is, is happening. So we're going to go with them, and uh, we're not going to need you for the, the segment. So thanks. We'll keep you in mind. And I'm like, oh, no. Um, you know, not that it meant a lot one way or another, but it was just kind of like this. I was I was like racing to get ready and kind of pull some notes together. And oh my goodness, this car is going to like pick me up. And, and, uh, and you know, I'm easy going. Like I, I've presented on, on television before, um, national television. So it's that type of stuff doesn't at all bother me. You know, people say like public spe- speaking, you know, is their greatest fear. For me, it doesn't matter. Um, but I just wanted to, to kind of, you know, get my information, get my stuff together, my resources and, and actually uh, call a couple people. Um, I know that our commercial, uh, drone operators to answer a few questions before then, you know, I was, I was whisked off to the secret location to, to be a part of this. So I almost made it. I almost made it Fox and friends. Um, so it's, it's my opinion. I, I, I took eight pages of notes for this. Now, before you tune out, I'm going to go through this pretty quick and I did large print this. Um, but, um, in my opinion, as a safety expert, the government response to Hurricane Harvey, the, the devastation caused by Hurricane Harvey, the response has been abysmal, okay? The response has been abysmal. Before I say more, again, I, uh, I am appreciative for the tireless efforts of firefighters, police, National Guard, and Red Cross individuals um, who, have, who have been working with this, and also the, also what would loosely be identified as the Cajun Navy, Um who have been tirelessly giving their time and their, and, and their resources to this right from the onset. Um, so I, I want to make that very clear. But again, the preparation for this, the mobilization of resources, um, was woefully insufficient. And and it is um, – so to, to put this in perspective, August 25th, Friday, August 25th, it was the day that the hurricane became a Category 4, and it was pretty pretty clear that it was going to um, bring significant damage to um, the lower Texas area. I'm not even sure so much at that time um, they knew how much Houston would be impacted, but they obviously knew Houston is not designed to um, handle a lot of water. And the building regulations, the the, the general um, uh, infrastructure regulations uh, in Houston aren't that great. And Houston is rapidly expanding, fourth largest city in the United States, and it's outgrown its infrastructure. So I watched a few documentaries just focusing solely on the gridlock that was going on in Houston. And these were things that were filmed like, you know, months, if not, you know, a couple of years ago, just saying the community's grown so fast just people coming in and out of work, you know, it's taking hours. So, um, so yeah, just crazy stuff. So what, what I did, it, it gets fuzzy. So people are like, where are they trying to point the finger on this? And I don't like to do that a lot on this show. Um, I like to explain situations and why situations happen, but right away we have interdisciplinary, intradistrict, multi-agency task force type things at work here. So it's like, who's in charge? Um, ultimately, you know, I, I would say it's FEMA, um, but FEMA has a, has a limited budget and FEMA also, um, needs to present an argument to the, the president to get, um, you know, orders for resources. 
you can look at governors um, activating national guards and, and so forth. But you suddenly, in, in, in Houston itself, you know, it's police forces, fire, and, and everything else. So you start to you see where you have these multiple agencies, and it's like, well, who's really in charge and who's calling the shots and ultimately who's paying the bills when all this is done, um, which we, we saw at Katrina, which we saw at, at you know, Hurricane Sandy and, and so forth. Um, one thing I think that's worse with a hurricane um, you know, it, it, it sets up, you have days in advance and that's where people have, you know, the, this time to plan and also this time to stall. When you had the World Trade Center attacks, boom, they happen and you had to respond or the 1995 uh, Murrah building bombing in Oklahoma City, it happened, um, the event had concluded and then you needed to respond to it. There, was, there wasn't any, um, you know, warning ahead of, of time you know, that, that these these things were going to, to happen. Um, but, yeah, when the hurricane happens, you, you get a lot of this kind of weighing back and forth of, well, you know, we've had hurricanes in the past. Some have hit. Some have missed. Do we, if we overprepare, you know, then people aren't going to um, take it as, as serious the next time. We know we have drill fatigue. That is a phenomena. We've seen that before. Um, also, in hurricanes, we've seen that before. You ride out one hurricane, you're much more likely to believe you're going to ride out the next hurricane. So um, one thing I wanted to do is I, I, I looked up the head of FEMA. His name is William Craig Fugate, F-U-G-A-T-E. Um, and he is the former administrator of um, the Federal Emergency Management Agency as Florida Director for the uh, the emergency management division, he oversaw the big four of 04 as the administrator for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. He organized recovery efforts for record of 87 disasters in 2011. So I'm looking at this like the first question, I'm like, is this like someone who's totally put in this posi position who's like never done this before? Um, and it, it's like, no, I mean, um, so th it's not a matter of, of having, you know, your your leadership in FEMA not having experience with um, significant events, you know, that that aren't too far off from something like this. So um, so just putting that right out, out the window, because that was the first thing. I'm like, is this just somebody that's, this is completely overwhelming and they don't know how to, to, to you know, formulate a coordinated response. Um, so there are some truths out there that people aren't going to tell you, and I am. The decision not to evacuate Houston was the correct decision. And uh, and that's going to be the Sentinel moving forward. Or th that'll be the standard moving forward for Sentinel events. One is you can't you can't evacuate Houston. You don't have the infrastructure in place to safely get people out of the city, and even relatively short notice, um, or, or or with some notice of of you know one two days, you're going to clog your arteries. And then, as we've all seen, you know, the, these, um, you know, these interstates underwater, and not just under, you know, a couple feet of water. I mean, we're talking 8, 10 plus feet of water. Um, had the decision been made to evacuate Houston, I believe there would have been many more deaths because of people basically drowning in their vehicles. Um, so I think that was the reason that decision wasn't made. Um, and I agree with it. I, I don't believe the infrastructure is in place to evacuate. In Japan, okay, in 2011, the Fukushima nuclear disaster following the earthquake. Um, Fukushima, by way that the bird flies, is 149 miles away from Tokyo. Tokyo is the most dense uh, population area um, in the world, you know, having... 13 uh, million people, or about 1.5 times the size of Seoul, the world's second largest metro. So basically, there was talk in Tokyo, and I know this from certain um, officials, that, um, you know, considering could we evacuate Tokyo if there was a radiation crowd, cloud moving this way? And, and the answer really was no, you couldn't. I mean, you would, you would have to go into measures of of you know having people secure themselves the the best as possible, but there were not the means. There wasn't the infrastructure. You couldn't mobilize. Plus, I mean, Japan just where would you go? Um, so there is this reality 
in large metropolitan areas um, that evacuation, you know, is is just not a feasible option for a lot of things, um, especially things that are rapidly developing, like uh, the Fukushima, um, you know, disaster, which was rapidly developing. I mean, again, you have some time with the hurricanes, but if you're in Florida, you know, you've got really like the I-4 once you go Orlando um, south, and if the I-4, um, you know, gets gets congested, um, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you got your sign in your hurricane route. So um, we're getting to this point where we are growing our communities, these metro areas, so rapidly and not having the infrastructure, um, the arteries to bring people in and, and out. And it, it doesn't take much, um, you know, a stalled vehicle, an accident or something. Hey, we see it all the time. I mean, if we travel and we go on the interstate, um, you know, I drive the interstate to work, and if, if you know, there's an accident, somebody spins out or somebody blows out a tire or something like that, I mean, we can have a backup for four miles, and you can be in your car for an hour. So um, we are getting to the point where we just have this realization it's not going to be um, effective to evacuate these large areas. Um, so nobody's really talked about uh, talked about that Um in 2001, September 11, 2001, 500,000 people were evacuated from um, lower Manhattan, and uh, that was them by boat. And that was also the this group of, of uh, skilled boat captains from different backgrounds. Uh, the majority, I think 37%, were tug captains. So they, they knew the harbor um, and... and you know, the, the crews had a lot of legacy knowledge, meaning that they had been together for quite a while. Also, the captains, it was during the day, um, great visibility and things like that. But this group came together, including, you know, sightseeing boats, and, and there were some Coast Guard boats. But largely like this, you know, this I would, would say was a civilian rescue or, you know, commercial type rescue. But these are people that didn't drill before. This reminds me of what's happening now with, with this Cajun Navy. So this system comes together because people have tacit knowledge, meaning like during situations like this, you know what to do. You can figure out what to do, and you can create systems which will last long enough to support the effort, to support the cause. Now, there can be things that come into the system, such as um, this is where FEMA had a, had a chance to, to jump into Harvey and, and really do some phenomenal um, reconnaissance and mapping and management of these resources that were coming in to make sure that, hey, we're not like going over the same area five times while we haven't even checked out this other area. Um, but anyway, it's different though. This, this, this rescue of lower Manhattan, 500,000 people in nine hours was remarkable, but you're basically moving people across the harbor. Okay. So you're moving people, you know, a mile and a half. And if you have a hurricane that's going on, you know, that that's not going to make a difference. I mean, you'd have to relocate, you know, 50 miles plus out of out of that area. Plus, I mean, how are you, how, how are you going to conduct this, um, you know, if, if you have hurricane situations, you know, high high waves and stuff like that? It, it, it just wouldn't have happened. So a remarkable rescue in that context. Um, but again different than what we what we have seen but a similar with Harvey but a similarity is an organic largely an organic rescue um, meaning you have people who are not typically rescuers getting involved in this and putting their expertise forward if there's a system they figure out how to interface with others um, they have their own tacit knowledge meaning they've they've worked on the sea they've had you know the ocean they've had training um, they understand, you know, the, the equipment, the uh, things like that. So, um, by, by definition to, um, you know, New York has a population of 8.5 million, Houston, a population of, uh, of 2.4 million, just to kind of put that in perspective, Houston, the fourth largest city. But again, Houston grew re in, in, you know, New York, lower Manhattan, I mean, being an island isolated off it. Houston, you know, you'd think you'd have ways out of Houston, but again, the problem with Houston is a little bit of rain. I mean, um, you know, when, once you get above uh, an inch of, of rain, you start to have potential flooding, 
And when you get, you know, 20 plus inches of rain, it, it overwhelms your your systems and, and goes over your roads and, and wipes out your ability to access infrastructure. So um, it, it, in that case, and already, already well documented, people could not get in and out of Houston effectively, um, you know, during work days. And, you know, the... The play, Houston was just growing at a pace that was outstripping the arteries um, to bring people in and take people um, out of the city. So the uh, the unspoken rule of world governments is that some population centers are simply too large to evacuate. You probably haven't heard that before. I'm telling you right now. Um, it, it's And this is coming into play also a little bit with uh, North Korea and whatever's happening with the firing of missiles and things like that, but you're going to have certain areas like Tokyo. Again, you're not you're not going to be able to ev evacuate Tokyo. It's just not going to happen, um, and especially in something that is relatively short amount of time frame, you're just not going to be able to do it. So, um, Harvey. So again, the point uh, from the from this intro part of the discussion is: had the order been made to evacuate people, I believe we would have had hundreds, if not thousands of people who would have drowned in their vehicles. So the decision to stay, um, although that did not, you know, that was, was certainly um, done with a full knowledge that there would be peril and probably deaths, you know, related to that, you know, which did happen, uh, putting people out on the roads would have been absolutely a disastrous decision. Let us take a break right now. Um, and I want you to learn a little bit more here about the safety doc. You can follow me on YouTube. I've gained, um, you know, gained subscribers. You can go into SoundCloud. Hey, I'm going to be moving probably over to Podbean soon, but just go to safetyphd.com. Safetyphd.com, brand new website. It is phenomenal, brand new. It's going to be the home of my, my blog, all my social media, video, everything else will be there. It's the clearinghouse, safetyphd.com, and uh, everything you want from the safety doc will be there, including all of the blog posts, all of the weekly shows. So thank you very much, the Safety Doc Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. And welcome back. Desensitized. People have become desensitized to disasters. They, they've recalibrated to this higher threshold of a normal Taurus. We talked about the Taurus in the previous episode. It's your day. You get up and it's like, I expect to have my coffee. Um, this is going to be what I'm going to eat for breakfast. I'm going to get in my car. It's going to take this long to get to work. You know, once I get to work, you know, take this long to get through the mail. I might have this for a meeting, you know, whatever it might be. But it's basically saying, um, this is this is your this is your your Taurus. Uh, so people people have gotten used to um, when it comes to hurricanes. Of of yeah, I mean the hurricane's going to come in. There, there's going to be quite a bit of damage, but you know, um, most we we we're probably going to make it out uh, okay. And there used to be these things, hurricane parties, and I assume they still probably happen. If you actually go online and type in Caddyshack, the movie Caddyshack. They had a hurricane that's that struck the golf course where this was being filmed um, midway through filming, and they basically had a hurricane party. So Rodney Dangerfield and you know the other actors, I think they went to the second floor of 
some structure that that was on the golf course, and they basically just just partied it up. You know, they they had a party for a day or two and and waited out this this hurricane. I don't think it was to the level of Harvey. Um, after that, you know, they cleaned up the golf course and the water drain, and they kept shooting. So um, people have become desensitized, and every time you um, survive a hurricane or it's not as bad as predicted, okay, you're going to recalibrate to to that, saying, you know, I went through this before. I'm going to wait it out. And I think people knew that um, – they, they knew that Harvey was going to be pretty intense, especially with with what it was going to bring for rain. But, again, this was unprecedented. So it's not like um, in, in that case, too. I mean, I think they recalibrate to, you know, well, we've had rainstorms, and maybe you've had five, six inches, and it's around for a day or so, and then it drains. Um, so that's what they're probably thinking. They're not thinking we've had 25 inches of rain, and I remember it was here for, like, five weeks. Um, so... People are more likely to underestimate the importance of warning of an event. Um, you know, they think, you know, it's not going to be so, as severe as predicted. And we used to get that all the time. And I think they backed off on that with, like, severe thunderstorms and even tornado warnings and things like that. Um, of I, I remember the days, and, and they don't do this as much anymore, but I remember at least when I grew up in Wisconsin, they would send out the weather the weather vans or the weather vehicles, and they're going to track the storm, and they would report from underneath some gas station, you know, where you pull in, and they've, they've, they've got that, that covering um, up above. So, um, you know, it would provide a little bit of shelter, although I don't know why those things just didn't take off and fly. But, um, you know, they pull up by the gas pumps, and they'd be like, you know, we are here at whatever, and, and you know, we hail, and look here, the window's cracked, and, if you're in this area and, you know, don't be out. And, and, of course, it's like it's all done for drama. I mean, don't be out there tracking this thing anyway. I mean, you should be where it's safe. Um, that was maybe like 15, 10, 15 years ago again. But I, I think they, they stopped doing that because people started to imitate that behavior and put themselves in the harm way, harm's way. Um, people think it's going to pattern to the previous storm. Again, the, I read uh, I read an article about um, uh, an elderly gentleman who survived um, hurricanes. He lived in Louisiana, and I don't know exactly where. I don't think it was too far from Slidell, but his entire life. And uh, so, but he had survived previous hurricanes. And when Hurricane Katrina hit, I think it was like in his 70s or something like that, he said, I'm just, I'm, don't, you know, I've been through hurricanes before. I'm not going to evacuate. And he didn't. Stayed at his house. And eventually they found him deceased. He was in his attic. I believe he had a heart attack. He did have like a jug of water with him and, and a, a limited goods. Um, but what had happened is there was development taking away a lot of these, these drainage areas and these buffer areas um, that would take care of the storm surge. So over time, that those had been removed, and his property then was was bearing much more of the brunt of the storm. Um, and, and, yeah, he definitely... That was a vari- variables he didn't he didn't account for because he was just patterning. It's going to be just the same that it was. Well, no, these contextual variables change, um, and we have but much better you know modeling you know systems today. Um, in that case, he did he did have the opportunity to you know to get out of there. That wasn't one of those big metro um, areas, but um, people also underestimate the duration of the event. You know, like the hurricane hit. Okay. 25th, you know, the hurricane comes in, starts to make landfall, hurricane hits, but then, of course, the rain that continues with the hurricane and how that hampers subsequent, um, you know, rescue efforts because roads are flooded. You cannot fly it, a drone um, during heavy rain, during winds, you know, commercial drones just don't have that capability right now. Um, so overall, you know, rescue is compromised by by that. People have not had an uh, experience with interruption of resources, so they haven't gone to their Walmart and and seen it empty. Or if they have, they've gone back and it's you know things have been on the shelves in a few days, or or the gas stations have been replenished. So very few people have the, this this sense that. They're going to have this long interruption in their supply chain. They might know that there's going to be some interruption from, you know, previous storms that run on lumber and, and you know, 
fuel, water, food, things like that, but then it's going to be replenished. But what's happening, again, with the, the depth of the Harvey, um, the Harvey disaster is you don't have the infrastructure to get the resources in, and this is where FEMA needs to really step up and as of today, they've off authorized up to 24,000 National Guard members um, to um, support the rescue, which August 30th, we're talking post-rescue. You have to mobilize all of these folks in, in, in any way to come in and then where are going to, to be your areas for distribution um, of basic necessities and so forth. But um, so let me just go that go through that again, this whole desensitized thing of, of, of humans. You know, we... We, we recalibrate to this this higher torus or basically thinking we'll, we'll survive, we'll get through this. Um, because in most cases we do, you know. Um, it's not going to be as severe as predicted. We convince ourselves that. It's going to pattern after previous storms. Hey, the last storm that came through, it really wasn't all that bad. Um, so, you know, this is probably what we're in store for. The duration isn't going to be that long. Um, and, you know, if our supplies dwindle, There'll be trucks, there'll be, you know, um, airdrops, whatever. People, our, the supplies will get here. It's the United States. And, um, you know, also assuming that if this really goes bad, like if this completely goes south, bad situation, the government's going to step in and and they're going to take the lead on this, um, which they, they really didn't, okay? And this 24,000... Um, National Guard, you know, five days into the event, and then you have to look at mobilizing, bringing them in and trying to interface them into an already uh, chaotic instant command system. Um, you know, that's, what is it, closing the, the door on the, the barn after the horses are out or something like that. So Katrina, Hurricane Katrina in 2005 um, had more loss of, of life than Hurricane Harvey. Um, also, though, had a much more concentrated area, physical geographic area of impact. Harvey is substantially larger. So the recovery from Harvey is going gonna, gonna to require a massive, um, a massive investment in um, uh, reconnaissance, identifying the safety of infrastructure and, and, um, and repairing. So Katrina, much more concentrated. Um, Harvey, much more widespread. So Katrina, we had day, days of warning with Katrina. Logistics for rescue are complex. I get that. I get that. But, you know, FEMA had Katrina, lessons to learn from Katrina, and still fumbled the ball in this rescue. Okay? A little leadership goes a long way. We tend to mobilize resources and respond much faster to unforeseen events. I talked about that. Murrah building, World Trade Center, things like that. Um, and But, you know, when, when things play out over a longer period of time, the sense of urgency just isn't, isn't quite as high. Let me move on here. Um, so the issue, mobilizing the state National Guard and federal military should be much more efficient than it actually was in, in Harvey. There, there's no excuse. So again, August 30th, as I record this, August 30th, 24,000, I believe 14,000 plus an additional 10,000, so 24,000 total National Guard um, were authorized to support this event. So that's, that's folks, that, that's four days too late. And, and maybe even more than four days too late. Um, so, again, if you think about that, you have to mobilize. You have to get these folks there. You have to debrief them. You have to get the equipment ready. And so it's realistic that maybe in three to five days you'll have boots on the ground. And then you have to interface them with the existing rescues that are happening through all these different agencies. You know, law enforcement is called instant command system, law enforcement, uh, FEMA, and then also the organic um, rescue, which would be largely referred to as the Cajun Navy. If you go in and type in Cajun Navy, they actually have a website. It is what I would say is um, pseudo acknowledged and um, condoned by um, Louisiana. It formed after 2005. Okay, it formed 12 years ago. Basically, it's a it, it is a a grassroots citizen group. They assemble boats, pickups, um, other rescue gear, supplies, and and respond to rescues. Um, re, you know, rescue efforts. So it is, you know, it's completely volunteer. 
you know, they're not compensated. They take donations. So they are coming in droves right now into Texas. So FEMA needs to be, FEMA needs to be coordinating um, th- this this Cajun Army or, or Cajun Navy influx. Okay, um, that's what they need to do is to to stage them and say we need you here, we need you here, we need you here, and understanding what the capabilities are with the Cajun Navy. Um, you know, I read up the Cajun Navy has actually gotten pretty sophisticated. Like one of the groups had a meteorologist with them, and the purpose of that meteorologist was you know to do his his job of 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 watching uh, what was going on um you know with the weather and and then you know using that information to inform where and how those rescue efforts would would carry out but they have other pro- professional specialists that they bring in and, and kind of inform these these groups so um and this this organically happens these structures come together people have tacit knowledge it's happened for years it's it's it's, it's happened um, we talked about the, the harbor rescue during September 11th, but we could just go back through time. People come out and they help each other. So, um, and, and you know what, there's, there's this move on right now to regulate the, the Cajun movie or the Cajun movie, the, uh, there'll be a movie about that, the Cajun Navy. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. So the, uh. The Cajun Navy, this is something else, okay? This is the, the Cajun Navy is utilizing Facebook. So they're having people post on Facebook of saying, this is my location and I need to be rescued. Now, Cellular went down um, and, and it's been partially restored and it'll be more fully restored. And you, you can text message um, even with a pretty compromised communication system. Now, one thing is if you... Um, if you have a satellite phone, which most people do, but if you do have a, a, a Garmin in, in GPS, the Garmin understands where you are because the Garmin is pinging to satellites. And at any one time, it's pinging to maybe 17, 18 satellites. So um, it doesn't matter if the cellular system's out. The Garmin is still going to tell you where you are. And if you are um, using a, 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 a GPS-type device, it is at least going to let you know where you are. And then through any two-way communications or now as, as people start to get in um, and, you know, this Cajun Navy and, and other rescuers and start to get into areas, they, they can understand what's, what's happening out there and communicate with people. And as cellular is restored, people can get in and, and post messages, for example, to Facebook. But get this, okay? So, like, this is contemporary. You, you would think, like, FEMA would be all over this. Like, they would have this high-tech side of this that they would come in they would produce mobile hotspots, which you could do. You could bring in, um, you know, either, um, you know, amphibious craft. You in, This is a little bit out there yet, and this would be short-lived, but you could technically do it. You could have drones serve as mobile hotspots. The only thing with a drone, it, well, a few things with a drone right now, it, commercial drones. Um, this, I thought, was going to be the infancy of, This would be the hurricane we would look at and say that's when drones came in and made a difference. They came in and did reconnaissance. They were used for mobile hotspots. They brought in some supplies, some of these things, which are all capable. Um, But drones, first of all, we don't have a lot of commercial drone operators, which are different than hobbyists. Commercial go through a lot of the same training um, that that pilots go through, and um, they also – you know, the drones that even, you know, when I had it on the show, I had Preston Rice on the show a few weeks ago, even the, the expensive drones with infrared and, and the 4K cameras and all of this thing, I mean, you can fly them for maybe 20 minutes on a charge, and now you throw like a wind in there and rain, and that, that decreases. And um, drones do not communicate with each other. The military in January of, of 2017, so, you know, about eight months ago, um, dropped, uh, I believe it was like 107 drones, um that were 3D printed, by the way, about the size of your hands. I mean, it, you, you can do this stuff pretty fast. I mean, you can bring in a truck. You could bring in a truck and have a drone fleet that you could, you know, quickly either, you know, descend or ascend from the ground or you could drop it from up above, um, and, and they could act as a swarm and, and have this incredible surveillance tool um, or else, you know, use it for a mobile hotspot or, you know, whatever it could be. Um but 
so drones just aren't robust enough to to stand up to you know winds and storms and that. So you would have had to bring that in post that event. Um, you know, you know, once once the rains had had subsided or, or gotten to a point when you could you know you could get drones out there. But those opportunities did and are presenting themselves. So you do see some video on TV and, and stuff like that. It's like this was shot from drone footage and stuff like that, and, which is good. But, again, none of this is really coordinated very well. So you get these little snippets. And you need a full mosaic. One of the things I was I, – I talked to another expert today, and I said, you know, um, imagine if you would have gone to, you know, the, the Astrodome or, or some of these places. I don't, I don't – wherever the Houston Texans – play whatever but um or sports stadium or the rockets play I, I don't know okay but you go where you have these super large high def screens and and you take those over um f- uh, and, and fema has the ability to do this fema does have the ability to do this i i was involved um where when i worked for a school district our buildings were taken over by fema after a major flooding event um and anyway um and to have these monitors and then go out and have the surveillance take place and and have this this map and have everything kind of gridded out like this is section 1a this is section 1b this is section 1c and pinpoint the actual longitude and latitude of like here's what we observed and if you're doing this in 4k during the day you have super high resolution and you can also go through with that forward um you know infrared and there's not as many drones equipped with that right now so um, it, you could get in for red readings, um, but I'm, I'm going to get into to a way that that drones could have been used, and, and there's still an opportunity to to really be effective drone operators. I got contacted when when Hurricane could, Harvey hit. I got contacted nonstop by drone operators from the greater Texas area, nonstop because I had done a show with Preston Rice, and people were googling. And, and coming up and, and trying to find a way to offer their resources. And they were saying, we know you did this show um, through, the, through you know, either your connections or through greater drone um, commercial operators. Are you able to share information on who we can contact to volunteer our services? So I worked diligently to do that the best that I could, and that wasn't clear. And that was ridiculous that that information was not put up um by fema that it was not redundantly you know distributed out there of uh, ahead of time and then through the event you know through through radio stations um you know you could have had you know leaflet flyers that were were you know dropped and 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 things i I, just other means of of saying here's here's who to contact and to say that you overwhelm your 911 system that well of course you do it's not made for that but then you have systems which coordinate into this um, multi-agency systems, which should fairly seamlessly come into this, uh, including military, to have robust communications. Um, And none of that happened. It's a shame. There's an app that's out there called Zello, Z-E-L-L-O, Walkie Talkie. That was used by the Cajun um, Navy, used right now. So the Zello Walkie Talkie app, um, in quote, Zello is the place for free, live, private, and public conversations. People are using that to ask for help, okay? And I had people, again, I had people even last night emailing me and saying, I called this number, and they're not mad at me. I didn't give them the number, but they're saying, this is the number that's put out there, like, if you need help. And they'd say, like, nobody responded. Or someone responded and said, okay, but I can't do anything about it or whatever. So just a shame, just a shame, folks. Um but let's talk about the Zello Walkie Talkie app. That technology did not exist in 2005 during Hurricane Katrina. So this is modern technology. Why isn't FEMA using this? The Cajun Navy is. They're on top of this stuff. They're using stuff like right now, whatever is out there. Um, they're like, we'll use this. Okay, we're going to use it to social media to our advantage. We're going to use this Zello Walkie Talkie app. And and FEMA is, you know, it's like dusting off the three-ring binder and going through the, the processes. And I know people in FEMA are going to be pissed that I'm saying this and upset. Um, but you know what? You could have done, and you should have done a much better job with this. And I know you have uh, you have restrictions. And I think um, actually, you know, higher up, this, this could have been greased um, and expedited. I'm going to talk about that at the end. Um, but 
the amount of resources allocated to this and the type of infant incident command uh, you know system uh, protocols that were were put in place were woefully um, insufficient for the scope of this disaster and, and anybody would have recognized that right away anybody so so we talk about this Cajun Navy which I didn't even know existed okay the Cajun Navy uh, it's an example of people with talents, tacit knowledge, patriotism, compassion. They rally to form a system that exists long enough to carry out rudimentary rescue t- efforts. This is something very clear that I've pointed out um, in my work. Uh, people, um, th- there, there's drills right now. Start a school. What happens? We have intruder drills, multi-agency, police, fire, EMS. You know, SWAT teams and, and, and whatever coming in and, and getting into a school as if, you know, if doing an active shooter drill. Um, you know, the, these high these high drama simulations, which I don't agree with um, because you, you prepare very in a very linear method for something that's very nonlinear. And also um, those are not the same people that are probably going to be responding to that rescue a day, a month, two months after that. People, different shifts, different agencies. It's an all call. It goes out. But this Cajun Navy is a great is a, it's it's a great example of um, of filling the void. You know, something needed to be done. Okay, you did not have the the National Guard there. You didn't have the military there. Um, Houston's resources were overwhelmed. I mean, um, it's uh, any metropolitan, any any city's not designed for this. We had a a massive industrial explosion, um, a few communities over, and the community itself is like 700 people, and um, you know they had their fire department respond, and then I believe 36 other fire departments and and rescue squads, um, you know, to this, uh, five fatalities and and you know just massive massive damage. But you're going to, you know, quickly overwhelm um, your your resources. The best efforts by these folks, it's just not enough. The situation is far, far in, too much, too intense, and and um, last too long for uh, you, you. You fatigue people, and you don't have people to to replace them either. So, um, so why does this Cajun Navy exist? Basically, it fills the void. You don't have the the National Guard there. You don't have the military there. So. They come in and and they fill the void. It's admirable, um, and uh, you know they 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 make th- okay. The thing is, make the most important thing the most important thing, and that's humanity, and that, and that's what this Cajun army does. Okay, um, it, it it's folks. It is really a good thing. It is a good thing. The Cajun army, the Cajun. Okay, Cajun Navy. It could be Cajun Army too, because I mean, there's a lot of ground stuff. I'm I'm, I'm conflating terms a little bit here, but the, the, it, technically, it's called the Cajun Navy because they they come in, you know, typically four wheel drive trucks and and boats and and uh, you know they're they're working on self dispatching. Um, but what happens is there there's legislation, and I looked I looked back a couple of years, and it's been out there both in Louisiana and in Texas legislation to limit the Cajun Navy, basically, or civilian rescuers that, that come together to form these systems. And these systems naturally form, okay? People call them affiliations in some studies. I think that's garbage. They're systems. They form, and they form for as neat as, they, as long as they need to be there, you know, which is typically um, a system like that and with adrenaline um, and people coming in, you know, you can sustain that for three, four, five days pretty well before the system itself will will kind of start to to fall apart. But um, um, the the system of the the Cajun Navy coming in, I mean, they know what they they need to do. They're going to figure it out. They're going to look at context and situation, um, and they're not new to this either. Okay, um, so. But they don't interface well with local instant command systems. So if you have your county sheriff or whatever it is, they might say, you know, we don't want the Cajun Navy here. We've got this under control. We don't know what they're bringing to the game. We don't know how they've been trained. We don't know the equipment. Are they going to interfere because we're already searching this area, so they're going to go in and search it again? Are they, you know, they're not aware that, the, that we have in, underwater infrastructure, which they could run into, or, or power lines or things like that. I mean, you can come up with all these excuses. 
Um, so liability comes into play, and I think people look and say, you know what, um, I'm not sure we we really want these plug-and-play volunteer rescuers because what if something goes wrong? What if they're carrying out a rescue and some infrastructure collapses or a boat overturns and eight people who are in the Skagen Navy drown? Then what happens? Who's liable? Or what if they're rescuing some people and, yeah, they strike a power line and the people that they're rescuing, um, are you know, die? So and pulling back from the big picture of this, it's like um, – this is a dangerous, chaotic, fluid situation, and, and it does not mean that things aren't going to go wrong. The reality is, though, that these are pretty smart folks. They have tacit knowledge, um, and they're out to preserve their own life as well as preserving the lives of others, and, and largely things are going to, you know, to go well. And the fact is, you take them out of the equation, what do you replace them with? Nothing. Avoid, because you don't have your National Guard there with amphibious vehicles and boats coming in, um, your traditional Navy, um, other government um, organized rescues, they weren't there. So um, there's legislation, and I looked some some recent um, in 2016, wanting um, basically to, to, I think, ban the, the, the Cajun Navy. Some, some areas have, like they've, they've come to rescue, and they say, you're not welcome here. And if you trespass against here, we're declaring a martial law zone and all that, then boom, you, you're, you'd be arrested. Um, now, the Cajun Army, I, I don't know. I think, I don't know. Some turn away. Some just do what needs to be done anyway. If you act in the best interest, this is not legal advice, but um, I did research 60 legal cases where people acted in the best interest of others can, in, in light of the situation and the context, and they were vindicated in each one of those situations. Um so what happens is, yeah, Louisiana is kind of like, you know, we're glad we have the Cajun Navy, but we're not going to go out as far as, like, actually endorsing the Cajun Navy. It's just kind of like they exist. We know they're over there. Kind of give them a wink of, like, thank you, um, and, and then, you know, just, just kind of leave them to do what they need to do. Texas has gotten a little more aggressive on that. But some of the things that they want to do with this Cajun Navy is they want to say, you know, if you're going to, if, if, you, if this exists, if this Cajun Navy exists, which might mobilize once a year, once every multiple years, I mean, once a year for something that would be a, you know, smaller, smaller, more localized, whatever, um, and then it disbands. The question is, though, um, you know, do we, should we make these people do training in order to be a member? So they'd have to have like some kind of card. Um, and, and then who's going to pay for the training and how frequent does the training need to be? What kind of equipment do they need to have? Um, all of these types of things are, are, have been proposed. They're out there. They're actually out there. Um, and it, it is ridiculous because once you do that, once you do that and say, you know what, if, if you're going to participate in the Cajun Navy, um, you're going to have to take uh, 15 hours of, of these types of classes, and you're going to every three years have to do a recertification. Your vessel's going to need some special tag on it. You're going to need a, a number. Um, you know, so when, when you check in that you're part of a database, so we understand, you know, where you are and, and things. And some of that, actually, I don't think is bad, you know, for anyone involved in a rescue. But um, you're going to kill this thing. You're going to kill this thing because of politics and posturing and this territorial horse crap of saying, um, you know, we, 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 we don't want you here. You know, it, it reminds me of the Kursk. When, when Russia lost the Kursk. The submarine, nuclear submarine, um, had explosion hydrogen peroxide oil technology, um, exploded the torpedo tubes, the curse sank. I believe there were three compartments which were still um, um, airtight and, and had survivors. But, um, but Russia stalled. They, they had um, offers from the international community, um, the United States, um, you know, Great Britain, who had you know, very superior rescue equipment available at that time. And, and they just stalled. It's like, no, we're not going to, to access like your, you're not going to come over and part of, I don't know, part of the pride. Is that what's going on here? Um, and, and, you know, ultimately everybody who was alive died on the curse. And, you know, we know people were alive for a while because they did leave notes and things like that. But, um, but the, the U S knew that the curse, you know, exploded and went down, as soon as it happened, I mean, they had another sub in the area, 
and and recorded the the two explosions, the smaller one and the larger one, and and knew that the sub had gone down. Um, but you you see this weird political posturing too of kind of like this defensive, like we don't we don't need you. Um, and then I think it's this whole liability thing too of like, well, if we if we condone it, then are we responsible for it? Um, and so I don't think this at all is about training. I, I, I don't believe for a second these bills that come out and say, well, if we train them, then, you know, they'll interface better. Well, my, my goodness, like right now you've got your responders and it's haphazard, okay? It's, it's the fact that FEMA needs an intense training with an incident command system team. That's what needs to happen. There needs to be a FEMA ICS, incident command system team. All they do then is they come in and they set up and they manage the data coming in. So they manage the data. They get the flyovers from drones, from planes. They understand the priorities of where to put resources, the resources available that are coming in, how to stage in different areas, and then how to, to bring those um, resources into people, how to rescue people, bring them out, um, check them over, and then get them to another you know secured area. Um, that's what needs to happen. Okay, that's what FEMA needs to be doing right now. So there is a there is a senator, uh, Jonathan Perry, um, out of Louisiana. He is very much in support of the Cajun Navy. He proposed um, he he proposed a a a bill basically saying that you know he was in favor of having the Cajun Navy members be registered so they knew who they were. Um, and and kind of left it like at that, which, which was like the least extreme of all of these bills that were out there. And he got a lot of like pushback, a lot of pushback of people um, saying, no, they need to be regulated more heavily than than this. So he was the one of trying to to really kind of make a deal of saying, OK, um, you know, we'll let's we'll identify and maybe um, I, I give some protection to. You know, some greater protection to the the this this Cajun Navy and and some more authority um, overtly to say that they can come in during these these times, and you then would need some some sort of formal order, um, and that doesn't need to be real complicated. During nine eleven, it was Commander Loy of the Coast Guard who quickly said um, after the attacks and people were, were flooding to the harbor, Battery Park, Lower Manhattan, Commander Loy of the Coast Guard basically put an all call out saying. Hey, if you're tr if you have a boat and skills and you can help out with this, get over here and help us and do what needs to be done. Boom, that's it. Can be the same exact thing. And saying, you know, if you're if you're with the Cajun Navy, um, uh, you feel you can help out, contact us at this number or this, you know, whatever, and have these available and and then dispatch them to certain areas too. And you know the infrastructure situation again. You're female, you know. You know this stuff, so you can say, you go here, you go here, you go here, you go here. Yeah, it's a better use of your resources. So this is what I did. So I, I emailed Senator Perry a couple days ago because I, I think what he did was great. I think what he did was great because um, he stood up to people who wanted to heavily regulate this Cajun Navy. And you regulate it, you'll kill it. You kill it, you're going to end up having people die because rescuers are not going to be there. And it's, it, it goes against the American spirit. It's ridiculous, um, you know, to put this heavy legislation on. So kudos to Senator Perry. This is the email that I sent him. I'm going to read it in full. It's not that long. Um, Hello, Senator Perry. I am an expert in crisis preparedness and response and hold a doctoral degree from UW-Madison after defending a dissertation center to high-stakes decision-making across industries. This message will be succinct. I applaud your efforts to alleviate existing and potential barriers to civilian coordinated rescue efforts during sentinel crisis situations. At the moment, the self-dispatch of the so-called Cajun Navy is a perfect example of people mobilizing to offer expertise and resources to benefit others. In fact, a close examination of the 9-11-2001 Lower Manhattan Harbor boat rescue of 500,000 people by a collage of ship captains exemplifies both the potential and sheer need for unobstructed civilian rescue efforts. As Hurricane Harvey approached the Texas coast, several commercial drone operators reached out to me hoping that I could direct them to someone involved in a Texas incident command system so they could offer their drones and expertise to participate in aerial reconnaissance. 
I record a weekly safety themed and recent uh, uh, podcast um, airs on, on a radio show too. And recently interviewed a drone expert. Hence the reason I was sought by commercial drone operators. I estimate that a coordinated team of commercial drone operators could produce high definition reconnaissance video of impacted areas in 10 to 20 percent of the time it would take to do by boat or foot or plane by that matter or helicopter those are not efficient by the way plane and helicopter and it's, it's hard to hover into areas and, and you're also very expensive and, and very limited um, with those um, yet this isn't happening commercial drone operators are frustrated and lives are in the balance I'd be glad to talk more on this topic of civilian rescuers and to support your efforts toward legislation which preserves this integral feature of large-scale rescues in the modern era. Thank you. Okay. Self-dispatch is not technically efficient. After any sentinel event, whether it be a, a school shooting, um, a hurricane, um, you know, if it's an earthquake, you have a lot of people who will self-dispatch to these areas. Or even if it's um, somebody's lost, a, a four-year-old child is, is lost, and there's going to be a search and rescue. Um, you know, I interviewed Jennifer Fritton early on, on this show, um, several ep episodes ago, and she has a uh, search and, and rescue dog serenade. And one of the things she talked about was, you know, the self-dispatch that was happening in, in search and rescue. And you might have people who would, who would trample into to areas that, that they shouldn't go. And they would provide them different scents. They might interfere, you know, with the actual coordinated rescue that's going on. Or, like, you search the same area five times, but there's another area you haven't searched once. So self-dispatch is, is not te technically efficient, but it's going to happen. The Cajun Navy self-dispatched, Okay. It's going to happen. So what you do then, your FEMA, right, FEMA? Your FEMA, you have inputs. You say, contact us if you're self-dispatching. Meet here. Meet at this football stadium, this field, whatever, and then you have support there for those people, whether it be, you know, gasoline, food, field, whatever. You know, I, I don't I, I don't get this. Like, what, they have Sturgis, and they can put together this, this camp, um, you know, a community of, what, 15,000, 20,000 people, and they can put a camp outside for 100,000 people for a week. And it works. Um, there, there, there's. It's a military. We don't. I mean, if we cannot mobilize fee, the military and national guard for something like this in a matter of days, and 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 look around this area and say, here's where we can safely put together six areas. So report to any of these six areas. It's like that movie Independence Day. Like at the end when they're like, anybody out there who's flying experience. Um, you know, show up and then they kind of give them the crash course on how to, to fly the planes and attack the aliens. Okay, not exactly like that, but um, but yes. So these the you know see so see so have this Cajun Navy. You have these these drone operators and they're just showing up and they're like somebody tell us how we can help and there's no one out there telling them it's not coordinated. Again, that's where go back i talked about these jumbotrons and, and these massive efforts and then you can plug into this and, and and have this done at these centers and then have people um, being able to log in and to see rescues and where rescue areas are but um so so yeah so self-dispatch um you need it you need an efficient instant command system I, I believe right now from everything i've heard and i've talked to a lot of people um, that are participating in this rescue, there are multiple instant command systems. Instant command basically says you're in charge, and then you follow, like, this is the different layers of people in charge. And that, you know, that's happening. There's there's people who are in charge of county area, of, of you know, of, um, you know, state level. Um, the city has its own people in charge. So, so you don't you, you don't have this network that's working really well together, a lot of individual people. Um and that's where FEMA needs to come in and say, boom, we are in charge. We are instant command system. And everybody reports to us. And here's how and we're going to take the reins on this. Everybody feeds into us. Um, so um, dun, 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 dun. again, you know, we you you can literally have people searching the same area like like five times. So um Let's talk about drones. Okay, I'm getting kind of toward the end here. But before we talk about drones, you know what? 
let's let somebody else talk about the safety doc podcast thank you for tuning in to the safety doc podcast with the nation's leading safety expert dr david perodin author radio show host university instructor researcher expert witness and consultant powerful testimonials Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for staying with me. This is really an important show. It's, I, I'm very passionate about this. Um, it involves lives. I have relatives in Texas. I have friends in Texas that I've been in contact with. And, and, and I, I see that we could do so much better, and I see frustrated people who want to help, who run into barriers that just shouldn't be there. I see a system that dragged its feet when we knew on the 25th of August that this was a Category 4 hurricane and was also going to pack substantial rains. We knew that over an inch of rain causes problems in Houston. We knew the infrastructure in Houston um, could not handle an evacuation um, and would be flooded. I mean, all things that we knew. Okay. Let me back off a little bit. I'm gonna, I'll come back to that. So drones, drones. This was going to be, in my opinion, and it didn't turn out this way. We Some people have drones and drone footage and things like that, and it's just a fraction of what's out there. You could have, you could have taken a coordinated drone effort. Commercial drone operators are different than hobbyists. Commercial drone operators. Um you could have worked with commercial drone operators and had certain areas like longitude and latitude and obtain this mosaic really quickly. You know, once again, the weather needs to subside. You can't be flying out in a hurricane. There isn't a drone that does that. Um, but you could be out and you could be gaining this super high resolution, um, these, these images. And you would know then where to prioritize your resources. So that is key, okay? That is absolutely key. And just flying over with a plane and, and doing doing some of that, it does not get you the depth that you can, the, the precision. Plus, you can go in with these, these drones um, at lower level um, and, and the heat signatures and, and so forth and what you can do. But you, you could actually bring in with your drone operators, assign them areas, and you could get a pretty – solid mosaic of what had happened on the ground in a matter of a day, a couple days. If you, again, you, you need to support your commercial drone operators in doing that, and you say, you do this, you do this, you do this, you plot that in, you get that data, that data comes back in a visual. You have people who are looking at that, they're studying things, and they're saying, whoa, we really need to get somebody here. Like this is this is a, like a nursing and rehab center, and this thing's really been hit hard. We haven't had any communication. Or look over here, like this. This area seems not, um, that they're 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 doing pretty well. Like this, their infrastructure is held up uh, pretty well. So we are going to move them a little bit more um, down the ladder on prioritization. It all comes to prioritization. So um, you could have had that, and these people are volunteering this. Five years from now, first of all, drones are going to be much more robust. You're going to have the battery life. They're going to be able to fly in more adverse weather, things like that. They're going to recognize each other. That's one thing right now. Drones don't recognize each other, so a drone can fly into a drone. But it's a drone flying into a drone. It's not a person flying into a person. Um, so I thought this was going to be this opportunity for drone operators, commercial drone operators, to really show off how they could contribute to positively. And they were shut down, and the frustration was palpable. So... Um, I, um, so this is, this is, I communicated this back to Fox News and I did this with Fox on Saturday morning. I don't know what was that? The 26th, bring up my calendar here. 
Yeah, 26th of August, Saturday morning, I communicated this back to an individual at Fox, um, and I said, these are the things you need to talk about when you interview people in instant command systems, people who are in charge of, of the rescue. Um, these are the things that you need to talk about. So I, I'm going to read again. This I put this together, but I, I think it's going to be really helpful for you to understand, especially um, specific to how drones could have been used to obtain reconnaissance of what was happening um, during during you know the, during Hurricane Harvey. Okay, so I sent this I sent this to a specific person that I had been in contact with at Fox News. Um, I appreciate your message and offer to discuss how drones will be an integral component of the reconnaissance and rescue efforts for areas impacted by Hurricane Harvey. This will be the first time drones have been deployed in the manner, in this manner, for a sentinel natural disaster in the United States. And it demonstrates a remarkable step forward in crisis response. Drones will save lives over the next few days, no question about it. The top contribution drones will offer to the initial phases of rescue for Hurricane Harvey will be highly detailed video reconnaissance across large areas. Again, remember, you can't fly drones during the storm, but when the storm subsides, you can get the drones out there. Imagine these areas divided into grids per longitude and latitude coordinates, and a drone or drones and obtaining ultra-high definition video images of areas, um, and they're not overlapping, so it's not like a drone. You have, you, you have a crew of, of um, you know, five drone volunteers, and, and they all fly over basically the same area. You, you can disperse them per coordinates and, and get them out and take them that information, put it into, into this mosaic. Um, so um, ultra high definition, we're talking like 4K video. I don't know what that is. I know it's much uh, more high definition. Um, I, I I believe you can take 4K video and and zoom in, you know, where you, you can from you know 400 feet up above recognize somebody easily by face, easily easily by face, or read a sign or something like that. Things like this, ultra high definition video images, um, and then you could relay those images back to a central location. So you know you you're flying these drones and they can f come back and you can have a monitor right there where you're getting information real time and someone so typically how this would work is like you'd have someone watching the monitor too of like okay this is drone Z twenty one and it, this is flying over this area okay whoa 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 stop you just flew over go f go in the the area you just flew over do that again okay like stop and hover right there can you hover yeah the drone can hover can do a circle can do like a circle do you do like a hundred foot radius and, and get get us an image and let me let me look okay oh my goodness i didn't realize like we have sparking power lines like right there or something like that whatever it could be um so yeah you you have that capability of someone doing that and then all of that's recorded too it gets fed into central central database um a full mosaic of a 25 mile Square area could be obtained in a few hours. In the past, such early recon was conducted by plane or helicopter, both expensive and few number, and was combined with ground search and reporting of observations. A recent example is the 2011 Joplin, Missouri tornado rescue response. Admirable and efficient in the pre-drone era, but time-consuming and very demanding of human resources. So in 2011, Joplin, Missouri, um, largely wiped out by by a a tornado okay and i remember of all the fire departments i don't know if it was three or four they only had one that was still functional and they were able then to op get the apparatus from there and kind of work them them through the the city you know with with you know city uh, vehicles plowing you know getting the roads clear and, and get to at least the hospital um, but they didn't know what, what, what had happened to their community. I mean, they had to go up on, on foot and eventually, you know, did get a, some surveillance they were putting in. That took hours, um, you know, 15, 20, like a, like a day. You, you're there with a drone. Remember, I'm talking these, these, the, the January test that was done, the military test, these are 3D printed drones. These can be done ahead of time. They're dispersed. Um, you could, you could have drones literally obtain High definition video of all of the impacted area. Create a mosaic. You could, you know, and if you have battery life that can support that, you can you can maybe have it in an hour or two. And you don't have any people going out. You don't have any people walking by natural gas leaks. 
um, anything like that. Now, it, that is the first step, and then you, you get your rescuers out after that. But you don't waste time then sending people to trying, – trying to send people out not knowing where your priorities are. Um, you have already – you know, you might look and say, this area is really hardly hard hit. We know or, – or we can actually see people here. We, we, we know, yeah, like this, there's medical needs or, or this is a heavy residential area or something like that. But um, it's going to save you hours, save you hours. And the fact, too, again, we forget, like, people walking through these things and people who get injured and killed – because, um, you know, electric down power lines, um, you know, gas leaks, chemical leaks because of, of manufacturing that's been impacted. A drone is not going to be impacted by that stuff. A drone can fly through that. So um, reconnaissance time will decrease by several hours, if not days, for areas impacted by Hurricane Harvey and subsequently permit this batch of rescuers and resources to, to those areas faster than ever. It is possible that this event will be a demarcation point in large-scale rescue efforts denoting the evolution into drone-assisted search and rescue. This is a horrible event, but for the first time in history, we have a tool drone to positively contribute to the recovery in a manner that was simply not possible even five years ago. So that's what I had sent to Fox um, Saturday morning to my contact at Fox and said, get these questions kind of in, in the people who – can, can maybe do something to make it more welcoming to the several commercial drone operators wanting to um, volunteer their services. Um, I don't I, I don't know where that went, but I sent it out. So um, staging of resources, inventorying resources, dispatch resources, all those things. Um, once reconnaissance is done, prioritization is done, you're, you're staging your inventory, you're getting out to people, that just all speeds up. So, again, you use these tools like like the commercial drones and what they're capable of. Go back and watch the, the interview I did with Preston Rice a couple couple shows ago. Um, you can cut down this rescue time by 15 hours to one or two days, depending upon, um, you know, how wide your, your area is. That's huge. That saves lives. And, and you're doing – that then to best coordinate as you have people going out of saying um, rescue team or like your, your Cajun Navy, it's like, hey, we've got the Recon, but, so this is where we need you to start out. Like this is, this is probably our number one priority. You have to prioritize. So, all right, getting toward the end here. What we need to do, we need to get a handle on self-dispatch so we can more efficiently utilize these resources. Um, the Cajun Navy coming in, one is, are they are, are they clogging roads because they're taking in, you know, we're all coming in on the same road or whatever. I don't know. So these are things where you need to predict ahead of time and, and, and say, take these ways in, have different staging areas that are further apart um, to, like, say, you know, come to this area or come to this area, come to this area. Um, you have to have, you know, points of contact. Get that out there. I had so many people. And, and now the other thing is, like, there, you know, there, there's hundreds of points of contact out there. Centralize it. There's no excuse that you do not have a centralized number that you call. I give the Red Cross credit. I mean, the Red Cross has done a phenomenal job, but it's not their job to run this whole damn rescue and coordinate all of these other things. They're there to, to support. And they're phenomenal. And they do a great job on it. You could, uh, FEMA could learn a lot. Our president could learn a lot from how, how Red Cross responds to this. Governments. It's insane. All right. Um, get a handle on self-dispatch so we can more efficiently utilize these resources. This means indicating, you know, those points of contact, making it very clear if you want to help out, if you want to volunteer. Um, some vesting needs to happen. You know, a, a commercial drone operator, I believe, has a training card. And maybe it, it is with the Cajun Navy. Perhaps the Cajun Navy has some kind of formal membership card and a code of response protocol, but not a barrier, not where you make them go through 10 hours of training and they have to recertify and all this liability crap. You give them Samaritan status, but maybe just so you know, like, who they are um, so you can monitor the resources that you have. Okay, I think that resource management, so you know it's out there. Um, again, it's intent for tracking resources and not an intent for creating 
a barrier. You need to say again with the Good Samaritan. If you're asking, if you're coming here in the best interest, and you're helping out, um, then yeah, Good Samaritan applies too. The government needs to act quickly, decisively, and overbill its prep and response for Harvey level events. There is no reason on God's green earth that the 25th of August, Friday, we know it becomes a hurricane for before that, two, three days before that, that we don't have um, the head of FEMA or even our president of the United States, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing this as pro-president or as, as negative president. I'm seeing this as the leader of the country because, you know, this, this, this is the same thing that's happened in previous, um, you know, rescue efforts going back to Katrina and, and, and so forth. But, but to come out and say, listen, you know, um, the, here, here's, here's the deal. We are going to mobilize. Imagine the president coming on TV August 23rd. Okay, so two days before we have landfall for the hurricane, say, listen, um, all of the intelligence that I've been receiving on this indicates that this is going to be a substantial event. It's going to um, impact, um, you know, it, it, here's what we're going to do. I am authorizing, you know, FEMA is going to be our point of command. We are mobilizing um, 35,000 National Guard troops. We are taking these military bases and they are deploying amphibious vehicles. We are going to have six identified staging sites for the Cajun Navy for volunteers coming in with drones and whatever. And um, we will then utilize you, the American citizens, which make our country great. Um, and interface you with our rescuers who are doing a phenomenal job, but this is outstripping their resources, like, you know, the Houston Fire Department and police. We will interface you with them through our coordinated effort through FEMA. If you want to help, we, there will be a place for you to help, okay? We will find a place for you to help. But for now, like, work through us and then have FEMA right on it, the feet to the fire of saying, this is, this is the instant command system. This is who you contact. This is how you contact them. You have signage out on roads, um, and and you can have the, these these um, staging areas, and and then you you work people in from that. And there's there's to, to not have this reconnaissance on a more widespread scale, some organized reconnaissance from commercial drone operators. It it's a shame. It's not a joke because there's probably lives been cost. It's a shame. And yet, you have the Cajun Navy that comes in and uses an app that some you know uh, uh, that hasn't been around long, and they're using Facebook, and and they you know they're using what's out there to get the job done. You come in as a president, or you come in as the you know a, a joint president, a, a, a joint statement from the governors of Louisiana and, and Texas, and saying, "Listen, like this is what we're doing. We are doing this because this is a huge." A um, number of our, our population is going to be impacted, and and we're on top of this ahead of time. And if you want to help, here's here's how to help. And we're we're saying, but it didn't happen. It's and, and what is it? So it's August thirtieth. So we're five days past landfall, and all of a sudden we get the issue of twenty four thousand up to twenty four thousand National Guard troops. That's a recovery, folks. That's a reco that's a recovery event. Um, and and. To say, well, maybe during the hurricane there couldn't have been much done or whatever. I, I don't I don't believe that at all. I believe you could have you could have figured out where to stage, which would have been in two safer areas, and then maybe set up a secondary staging. But the fact that we have a, a the the most powerful, robust military in the world, and, and my God, we can't mobilize our military for a massive um, natural disaster, which affects our fourth largest city in the United States not including all of the, the communities proximal. It's ridiculous. If we, So this becomes this eerie thing then to me. I mean, I'm, the eerie message here is you're on your own. You're on your own if this happens. You are on your own to figure this out, okay? this this If, if something happens where you're at, um, uh, something that's this huge sentinel event, you're, you're going to be on your own for at least a large part. And, and things happen. Again, this is different because you knew this was going to happen. You knew this was going to happen. Um, but the fact that 
there was this, this foot dragging. Take a moment. Think about this. What if, what if President Trump, two days before this hits landfall, so let's take the 23rd, Wednesday, 23rd of, of August. Harvey is, is um, looking, you know, to be this, this substantial hur hurricane, looking to, you know, strengthen, have this, this massive impact. Um, and you come on TV. Imagine this. You come on TV as the president. You, you, you brief, you know, your, your cabinet and crew, you come on TV and, and you say, um, you know, American citizens, um, a few things. You know, one is this is what's developing. We're on top of this. And we've been, you know, advised by, you know, the top weather agencies, and, and I've been in contact with the military. And here is what we're doing right now. It might not play out where we're going to need this depth of resources, but we are we're, we are doing this um, because we want to we want to be on the air on the side of caution because we know the devastation that can be brought, and these are population dense areas, and we care about our citizens. And um, so here is how we are going to do this. Now, no, like these are dynamic, nonlinear situations. We're not exactly sure how this will play out. We ask for your patience, but we are we, we are stepping into this because this is bigger than any community, even Houston, um, and we are going to work with and support these state agencies. Um, but we are there, and and so like and here's here's what we're actually doing. This is, yeah. Off at Air Force Base in Nebraska, we're going to mobilize for airdrops of goods or whatever, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're doing this, and we're going to have ground troops on it, and and we are embracing the Cajun Navy, embracing commercial drone pilot, and we might tell you we don't need your service, and don't take that personally. Um, it, it it depends. We're not going to know fully until you know, but we are going to um, you know utilize the best intelligence and and, and utilize all of you to contribute. Um, to that, if if that's indeed um, what you can offer to us, and that's what it makes America great. Do you know what people would be saying? What would you say the next day? You would just watch that. That's in the news, and it actually happens. It's not just lip service. I would be blown away, and I'm just saying the president, whoever is in the role of president, doing that. That person has my respect. That person has my vote. You know, um, I, and yet it didn't happen. And you can look and get cynical and say, well, if you do this and you have to do it for the other one, and it sets a precedence and stuff like that. Garbage. Garbage. That's not the way we operate. Not in America. That's the way we do operate, I guess, in, in some of the stuff. I think we lost out on a wonderful opportunity um, an American opportunity, and thankfully the Cajun Navy has been accepted, and and they've come in. And really, I mean, it's one of these things too, where I think if you tried to ban the Cajun Navy, they'd be just be like, forget it. We're going to do what we need to do in the best interest of our um, fellow Americans and citizens, and you know, try try to stop us. Because when it comes down to it, you're not going to stop rescuers. You're going to continue working with them to rescue. Um, and all of this legislation that's out there to to try to, to regulate Good Samaritans and all of that, that stuff needs to go in the garbage can. And we need um, we need common sense in, in this type of stuff. Um, so, yeah, Regu regulating the Cajun Navy or, or similar systems would be det detrimental. It would it would lead to loss of, of life. These are the types of things that show how great individuals are how great americans are how individuals how actually whole communities can come together you know it's like there was a fire we we did a vacation up north and a, a place we ate at was built in 1892 um really nice place but it burned down it had a fire we learned of a week or two ago and uh but in this article it talked about how the local restaurants and stuff were bringing food to the firefighters and responders and, and, and helping out, um, you know, bringing, bringing resources to them, you know, just to help out. And that's what we're about folks. That's what we're about. So 
I'm for the Cajun Navy. Now, I I'll and I've been open with with statements to the to the fact that I'll I'll back the Cajun Navy. What that means from a researcher in Wisconsin with a PhD, um, who I think you know I'm pretty highly regarded. But um, anything that I could I could ever do to support why it is necessary. I've researched uh, many, many substantial uh, Sentinel events, and there's a there's a theme that organic based rescue efforts are a substantial part um, of all of these events, of all of these events. Um, and if you take that away, it, it is it's going to be detrimental. It's going to cost lives, and the Cajun Navy is adding a lot to this. And people have tacit knowledge; they know what to do. They know their equipment. They know how to interface. Could you make this a lot better? Yeah, you could. Just like I said with FEMA, and and coordinating and understanding, um, you know, through this through this reconnaissance, and then also better staging, and mobilizing different types of equipment. Um, I don't know that part. Mind boggles me. All right, folks, we are we are to the, the final page here, which I just put down, and I can't turn it back over, and I did. Embrace technology. That's another thing. FEMA's operating from an old model. Um, Cajun Navy's using a cell phone app, okay? They're using a cell phone. Facebook, I don't know, a little outdated. I'm not sure how I – but, like, the Zello app, it's not part of FEMA. Commercial drone operators will be able to obtain 4K video heat signatures within hours. That technology is rapidly improving. Five years from now, it's going to be phenomenal. And the thing is, you, 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 take, you take a drone out, and let's say five years from now, you can fly it for an hour. And you can fly drones at 70 miles an hour in perfect weather. But you, you, can, you can, let's say you can fly it for an hour. You bring, excuse me, hiccups. You bring it back, throw a new battery in it, boom, it's good. You take it out, and it keeps flying. I, you know, if a rescuer is out for a certain amount of time, I mean, they, they fatigue, they degrade, you have to then give them rest and food and, and replace them. So, again, I'm just saying this: these commercial drone operators, in this initial phase of reconnaissance, so then you can prioritize your resources. That's what I'm saying. And eventually you can get to this point, you know, Amazon has the drones which can deliver things. Um, you, you could hypothetically have a... a somebody stranded and you could you could bring them a couple bottles of water and a cell phone so they could communicate or a little package of, of food or something like that that is going to fully be um that that capacity is fully going to be there in five years you will have drones that will be able to come in and do very strategic drops of of resources and also communication tools plus they'll be able to service cellular hotspots cellular systems again are pretty robust um, and, and in, in the future, I don't, I don't think we're going to have nearly, especially text messaging, um, it, it, it usually survives through even the worst storms or, or can be restored pretty quick. And again, drones ping to satellites. That's the thing. So you can get out if the weather, like, like Joplin, next day weather clears up. That drone is out there. Even if cellular is impacted, the drone has the GPS map. All of us that have a Garmin or GPS unit, you know, you download the map. The map's in there. Once... The Garmin doesn't ping to cellular stations. The Garmin pings to satellites, so it knows where it is, and then it takes that pre-programmed map, and it knows exactly where it is. So you you can you lose cellular, and you can still have these drones um, to within feet or inches know exactly where they're at as, you, as you're doing this, this surveillance. So um, in conclusion, evacuations are not going to happen in large metro areas. We talked about that before. Um, I don't care what people say. I don't care about the signs that are on the I-4 saying this is the evacuation route in, in case of a hurricane. Um, folk, it just it's not it's not going to happen. Um, it it just is not going to happen. And they're not like Tokyo. Tokyo is not going to be evacuated. It's not going to happen. You can argue with me, the intelligence experts that I. Um, have worked with um, have told me no it, it, it's just not it's f not feasible and the people that we would put out in um, you know onto the roads and just th think again on Houston and, and, and gridlock and thousands of cars and 10 feet of water um, Houston Houston knew that they made the right they might they made the right decision it's it's a Sophie's choice okay it's a Sophie's choice we talked about that too there either way you're 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 going to have a negative outcome 
people are going to perish. But the Sophie's Choice is the taking the option which is going to give you the better of the two bad outcomes. Um, rescues have evolved. We now have, you know, this, this renegade rescue squad or this Cajun Navy. I'm sure there's other places which are kind of similar. I haven't researched. I need to get in and in, in to learn more in different areas if, if things like that exist. Um, and um, so you have that plus this traditional rescue squad, and you've got to find a way to interface both both of these, both of these. Um, and both can exist, and they do, and they've demonstrated that they can exist. Um, and, and, you know, I think we get with this posturing, we get this boasting of the chest crap going on and like, I'm in charge of this, or I'm in charge of this, or this is my territory, this is my county, or this FEMA doesn't have this. And, and then, I mean, and you, I mean, you know, we're declaring this a, a no fly zone, so we can't have drones in here. Um, in, in, well, you know, ultimately the FAA has the control over that and the FEA could step in and say, nope. You know, under an act of FEMA and, and the president saying we are giving the authority for, you know, drones to operate at, you know, 400 feet or whatever for this amount of time in, into these areas. And so, you know, meaning like a commercial drone operator could could fly over a hospital or things like that, which typically are, you know, no fly zones. Um, and again, we're talking you really have to coordinate this stuff. Sounds comp it is complex, but you have the technology to do it. But FEMA got into all of these goofy areas like that 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 I don't I don't even know what I, I don't think FEMA knows what they're trying to do right now. I think it's overwhelming them. And again, President, please step up. And I don't know what you can do now. I don't know. I don't think it's too late. It's I mean to visit is one thing. Okay, to visit is one thing. I'm not trying to be critical, okay? I, I because this is this is a pattern. Like this is just the way that things operate. But Stan, come out and say, listen, this is what's happening. We are mobilizing. We have the world's top military. We are mobilizing for our own citizens. We'll probably be there two, three weeks. We will then disband. It will be turned over to the National Guard. Um, you know, they'll be left, the National Guard will fade, it will be local, you know, control and, and, and so forth. The respect that you would earn from the American people and also people knowing that somebody has their back. This Cajun Navy, I mean, these folks are doing a wonderful job, but now, I mean, in everything that, in, in the, the news has done a great job supporting the Cajun Navy, which I was a little worried about because the legislation was kind of dark for a while, like looking like, you know, especially kind of late 2016 that the Cajun Navy was, was going to have some budget, some some heavy regulations put upon them. You can look that stuff up, easy to find. Um, but you're, you're seeing, you're seeing a real plus. You're seeing people support this um, in, in the mainstream media coming out and saying, and, and you're seeing it on Twitter too, coming out and supporting. Um, and I support it too, and I'm going to fight hard that um, we don't get into any mode of, of trying to to regulate um, good Samaritans and rescuers who are coming into a non-linear event that is basically chaos, by definition is chaos. And chaos is a good thing and a bad thing. You know, the fact that, you know, a, a chaotic situation makes it pretty clear what you have to do. Like you have to get, you know, if, if, if you have your boat, I mean, you're going – house to house and, and you have a certain process of, of what you're doing and, and you have to, um, you know, try to try to, to re reestablish, you know, some communication systems and things like that. But, um, but anyway, we have to let people know that we have their back as our fellow citizens. If that's us, if that's you and I, the safety doc right here, something like that happens and that happens to me, I do not want rescuers, civilians, you know, coming in with their, there's a tornado that comes in and, and there's a widespread devastation and it's really outstripping resources. People who come in with um, their, their uh, chainsaws and, you know, trucks and things like that. I don't want those people to think twice that if something they cut down falls and damages like part of my house or something that suddenly they're going to get sued and you know this and this and this. Are you gonna have Are you gonna have isolated stories of 
of negative things happening. Somebody shoots at somebody else or there's some that. Yeah. And that's going to happen no matter what. Okay. Um, you know, that happens during blackouts, things like that. But, um, I'm saying we have so much good that, that is going on and we need to support people involved with this. And from a FEMA and from a national standpoint to really get our stuff together, folks. And it's funny because someone asked me, they're like, you know, Dave, if you, if you were like had a FEMA, how would you, I'm like, I think I would know how to handle this. I honestly think I do. And I'm not trying to be brazen. I'm not trying to be, but I mean, I'm looking at this saying, this is how I think this should have been done. And also, Mr. President, step up and say, this is what we're going to do. What What is the worst that could happen? You mobilize, and it's not as bad as what was predicted, okay? And, and this is sentinel. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that happens once a decade. And, you know, you mobilize, and you mobilize our, our, our troops, our brothers and sisters and, and relatives, we lost an opportunity. Let's not lose it again. Thank you for listening to the show. Um, please subscribe on YouTube. You can get into the Safety Doc. Um, just search for the Safety Doc podcast, and I do have it all in a playlist, all the episodes. Um, I'm on SoundCloud, probably moving to Podbean, Mike, because SoundCloud's not very stable apparently with their fiscal situation. Um, I do blog post safety PhD is the website. I do appreciate Twitter followers and I just don't, don't promote my own stuff. You know, I will, I will tweet little things from articles and little comments that I'll find regarding, I cover a little wide range of safety, um, psychological safety to situational safety, specific events like this and things like that. So there's a good variety out there. Well, what I hope to do is just to, to help you to think about things from a different perspective and maybe give you some information um, that you didn't have have before, which ultimately could end up saving your life or the lives of others. Um, it's very important. It's, it's, it's my passion. This is very important to me. Um, so please um, consider subscribing to the show and recommending it to others and anybody out there who wants to contact me <laughs> fox news don't contact me and call me 10 minutes later saying oh by the way we found somebody else um i did watch that interview by the way and that person i mean did an okay job um for what they were asked to do but they kind of were they just had them there and they were kind of like using the backdrop and i i i think i could have talked a little bit more about this whole thing of like how drones are the future of getting in for this early reconnaissance and 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 getting these things and and that's the story i think that needs to be told and, and also like um to talk about the the reason why throughout history things like the cajun navy have been so effective and and, and why we can't suddenly get into this mode of trying to regulate or hyper regulate something like that because we kill that we end up killing ourselves so Thank you again for listening to the Safety Doc Podcast. You can contact me through my website. Um, I always do look forward to your messages. I will get back to you if you email me. You can post on social media. I respond uh, to, to people who post it. So, um, yeah, yeah, reach out. Um, God bless Houston and those affected by Hurricane Harvey. A sincere appreciation to the rescuers and the people contributing. Um, and to the people impacted by this, I, I'm wishing you the very best and a speedy recovery. You have a lot of people that care about you. I'm in Wisconsin, and there are a lot of people. This is a topic of conversation who care sincerely about, about you and want you to be well. So God bless everybody, and thank you for listening to this show.